21st July 2023. I'm just going to read one scripture out of that uh, uh, chapter in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, about faith. And then this may be a short video and we'll talk about it more later today, God willing. <clears throat> so it's all about faith. So verse 6. And having said all that, verse 1 to 5, um, God says, And without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him, faith. And there are many uh, scriptures around faith, <clears throat> and I call them circular. Circular scriptures, they literally go around in a circle. One uh, scripture on faith leads to another about faith, another about faith, another about faith, another about faith. And I'll put those into the notes attached to this video. <clears throat> But the, the phrase that came to me this morning very clearly was the well-known scripture just there. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay, and you take that into context of all the scriptures about faith, the new covenant in the context of the old covenant. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For all the reasons that are stated about faith, the circular list of scriptures about faith without faith it's impossible to please god and of course one scripture comes to my mind straight away you'll have others the righteous shall live by faith faith comes from hearing god did god really say set up buying and selling merchandise tables in the temple today. And by the temple, I'm talking about Christian church buildings. I'm talking about temples, if you like, synagogues, temples, Christian church buildings, cathedrals. And I've talked about this before. And please forgive me if you think I'm just laboring the point, because I know you get it, members of the body of Christ. But there are many churchgoers who don't get it. They've actually forgotten what Jesus said and did in the temple in Jerusalem, the outer courts, significantly twice, the first Passover and the third Passover. He drove the merchants out from the outer courts of the temple, buying and selling sacrifices. And I know the mindset of 21st century Christian uh, leaders of Christianity, Christendom, they don't get it because they are doing for God exactly what the world does, making money, buying and selling, making money for God, most Christian leaders would say. To do good works for God, most Christian leaders would say. And without uh, faith, without works is dead. They would quote that. And I would say, yes, amen. Faith and works of faith is worship but then of course works without faith without hearing god say to do that thing that you're doing that is not faith that's works without faith which the scripture is clear is sin faithless works is sin so he, i could easily not easily, I couldn't do it, but I could try to set up a Christian business with Trevor, a proper partnership by law, as a charity, pool our money together, have shares. I put 90% in and Trevor puts 10% in. I'm 90% the shareholder of that partnership. And off we go with a charity number and we start to make money and people start giving to God's work. It never happened. For 30 years nearly, 28 years, it never happened, even though somebody actually said, start your own church, start your own charity, two together, just the two of you, and then grow your church. No, no, God never confirmed it. It was somebody's idea, which was given like a prophecy, but it wasn't God. It's a good idea, but it wasn't God's idea. 
God has set me free from the business world, the marketing, the sales, the public relations, PR, doing things to make God look good. Public relations on behalf of God, like God is my client. And I am the one who organizes my client, God, to look good in the newspapers. Even saying it sounds so crass, as if God needed me as his publicist, publicist, his PR consultant. Me telling God that this will make you look good. And God has given us free will, even to sin as his disciples. As his disciples. Here was Peter, that one of the top, top, top disciples of his day, having two faces, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. And he thought that was right. I'll, to the Jews, I'll be a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'll be a Gentile. But God spoke to Paul, the new apostle, the new kid on the block, who faced Peter, faced him, and told him to his face, no, Peter, you're double-minded. You can't be a Jew to the Jews, a Gentile to the Gentile. That's not right, Peter. And, and who said Paul was right? Paul was a murderer, a persecutor of the Christians. Under that spirit of Pharisee, the persecutor, the satanic agent provocateur, I call them, a phrase I coined many years ago, because the Pharisees are sons of the devil, Therefore, they are satanic, and the agents who provoke true believers to catch them out. The spirit of Pharisee. And we can all be Pharisee. I can be a Pharisee. I can make my, uh, my journey in, in Christ my religion, and make others comply to my religion and my religious ways, but I'm not going to do it. This is why God has gave, gave Trevor to me, me to Trevor, 28 years ago. Walking on the same narrow way, side by side, with Jesus Christ in the middle. The cornerstone. We're not married in, in, the, in the biblical sense. We're not married, but we are in a partnership, equally yoked. And the yoke is from Christ. The yoke is light. The yoke that God has between us, Trevor and I, equally yoked in Christ, 50-50. It doesn't matter who pays, because the money is God's, God's money. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. And many people today would say, without money, we can't please God. Without the money to do things, we can't please you, Lord. And that's not faith. That's a worldly mentality. Without money, I can't do something for you, Jesus. Without money, I can't buy gospel tracts or little gospels to give out without money. Without money, I can't go to the Christian bookshop and get books to give out because they want money. Without money, I can't go to the church cafes and, and to buy or to get teas and coffees to take out of the building onto the streets and to give away free teas and coffees. I can't do it without money. The church cafes, restaurants, have all become businesses. And they think they're right. They actually use that phrase, the ends justify the means. But when you realize, and I, please forgive me, I'm not being super spiritual. Jesus Christ was not a businessman. He didn't set up his earthly kingdom as the king and order his disciples, his subjects, to do his will. He called them, he commanded them, put down your nets, Peter, follow me, come, follow me. Three commands. And Peter obeyed. Why? Gave up his livelihood. He loved fishing. 
There was something about this man, Jesus, that they all saw. There was something about this man, Jesus, that was different. And he wasn't just a carpenter's son. There was something different about him. And Peter put down his nets and he came and followed Jesus. And other fishermen do uh, too came and followed Jesus. And Jesus began a three-year, <laughs> I hesitate to call it a course or program, a three-year experience for them where Jesus was the Bible school teacher, the principal, the head master of the Bible school, the rabbi, the chief rabbi of Israel, the chief prophet, the chief prophetic teacher of Israel, the teacher who, who taught teachers when he was 12, asking them questions, searching them, but giving them answers as well. And here was Jesus, the boy, 12 years old, the son of God, his father, in his father's house. He knew 12 years old. And everything he learned, the Holy Spirit was his teacher. He became conscious that he wasn't like the other boys and girls, the other children. He wasn't like them. And they weren't like him. And he, he was tempted to be naughty, but he never did. They couldn't manipulate him. They couldn't control Jesus. His, his teenage friends, his contemporaries, the boys in the village, the girls in the village, there was something odd about this boy, Jesus. They couldn't control him, manipulate him, intimidate him. They couldn't dominate him. I see him like every child who's different faces bullying. They get bullied. And did he retaliate? Did he turn the other cheek? Did he punch back twice as hard? Jesus never sinned, never sinned, never had sex, wasn't violent, wasn't aggressive. Jesus Christ was the perfect boy without sin, no sinful nature. So faith, Jesus knew. As he grew up, he knew, 12 years old, he knew who he was, the Son of God, the Father in his father's house of prayer. And we've forgotten our, quotes church meetings, they get reduced to songs and a sermon and, and some prayers. But if you start your church meeting with prayer, forget about your program, forget about your rehearsed songs, but just wait on the Holy Spirit. This coming Sunday, God willing, there'll be a Sunday. For each one of us. God willing, there's a Sunday meet meeting and you all arrive and you quieten down. You've had your teas and coffees. You've had your chats with all your, your groups of people, your little cliques, and you settle down and you're quiet. You wait patiently before the Lord and you come to peace and stillness. And you wait. You even close your eyes. And a minute goes, two minutes, three minutes. That's a long time of silence. And the Holy Spirit comes upon one person. 1 Corinthians 14. That one person has faith and hears what God is saying. He or she stands up and prophesies. Another person joins, stands up, and the first person sits down. So we'll end it there, end of part one. We'll pick this up later, 1 Corinthians 14. God bless you, brethren of the one God. Pray for us as we are praying for you. God bless.